Hello there! It's Friday, which means it's time once again for the best movie podcast ever. The only movie podcast to offer objective and hyperbole-free discussion of every movie in the known universe. I am your host, the podcaster with no name, Conrad, and with me as always, 525,600 minutes of podcasting, it's Anthony James. <laughs> Probably about right, actually. Uh, how fucking feels that? like it, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, like, you know, it's good fun, all this sort of thing. Uh, Conrad, how are you? Uh, I'm well. I'm very well. We. I'm just. I'm concerned <laughs> about about the automated fish toy that my cats are playing with outside this room. Um, if they make any noise, I'll kill the bastards. But no. Apart from that, <laughs> <laughs> if his cats turn up dead, he didn't mean it. He didn't mean it. I don't. No, you can't prove anything. Um, no, I love them very much. How, how are you? Did I ask you that? I can't remember, but let's let's answer it anyway. How are you doing? You never ask me how I am, Conrad. Uh, no, I'm doing all right, actually. I'm doing all right. Uh, we're getting there. We're getting there now. Yes, that's true. <laughs> getting there. What does that mean? That's very vague. I know. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I, I decided halfway through saying it that I was going to leave it as vague as possible. You know, yeah, that's like... <laughs> When you have a conversation with someone that you do know quite well, but you haven't seen them in like five years or so, and you know, there's like you kind of you do the initial greetings and the initial pleasantries and the catching up mm-hmm. stuff, and then you real and then you remember why you're not that close to them anymore, and, and you have to sort of just like yeah. drag the conversation along by being like, yeah, yeah, getting, yeah. The clo- getting close to Easter and, uh, <laughs> and other. Well, that's, other that's, that's the go-to. The go-to, like every single person at work, the go-to is. One, the weather. Everyone talks about the weather. And two is, uh, you know, after a Monday, it's whatever, four days to the weekend. Four days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tuesday, it's just like hump just, day. Yeah, and, wishing uh, our, just wishing our lives away. Like, Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, I mean, I, I mean, that's very much, uh, very much at odds with the movie that we're here to talk about <laughs> this week, yeah, to be yeah. honest. Um, I wish I had the lust for life of uh, Jonathan Larson, quite frankly. I, I, yeah. um, I looked up... Um, like a little bit about him after i watched this movie because i didn't really know anything about him and um without getting too far ahead of ourselves finding out that he he like died having like you know uh committed his op- magnum opus to paper at the age of 35 which i will be in uh 20 days time i was a bit <laughs> i was a bit like oops <clears throat> should probably get started on the whole meaningful life thing uh, <laughs> so yeah we are here to talk about uh the uh, jonathan larson biopic i guess you'd call it a biopic it's not really his entire life i don't know if that counts as a biopic or not well it's actually a piece called tick tick boom which he performed himself yeah so i guess uh, it is the music it's, al- it's almost boom, like a, isn't it? it's, it's almost like a musical biopic that he sort of wrote himself i'm really interested actually to go and watch the original tick tick boom where he's like on stage because i wonder how different or the same it is i'm sure this has a lot more in it than that did but yeah i mean i would assume so i'd never even heard Mm -hmm. of it before this um but yeah okay so that's what we're here to talk about without Mm -hmm. further ado let's talk about some gosh darn movies let's do it movies they're everywhere they're all around us um just before we talk about tick tick boom there's a couple of things that um i wanted to make note of um in in the sort of preamble bit of the designated preamble section of yes. this week's show where we're allowed to talk about other things apart from the movie that we're here to talk about um first things first i was looking at the box office numbers this week which is actually two weeks ago at the time of hearing this because we fucked up the ordering of these but i'm <laughs> sure it'll still be true then and if not enjoy this walk back through to the days <laughs> yeah. of yesteryear two weeks ago yester week um, so the top five as of as of recording this are it, this is domestic in the u.s to be fair so it might be different in international they're mm-hmm. jackass forever no way home sing to and Mo- the new roland emmerich movie moonfall which i'm oh, yeah. gonna have to go and see because my partner's insisting upon the fact we go and watch that and then there's Moonfall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they should have got Adele. She's back in the public eye. They should have got Adele to do the song for that. It would have been yeah. great. Um, it's not like they can't afford it with the amount of money that thing looks like it costs. <laughs> I was going to say get Weird, weird Al. Just get Weird Al to do it. Oh, uh, that would have been so good. They should have got Weird Al to do an Adele piss take for, for Moonfall. It's probably yeah. not the tone. Let's be honest. It's probably not the tone that that Roland Emmerich wanted to strike with his 
movie about i don't even know what it's about i think it's about the moon literally, literally the moon into falling the earth. yeah okay fine so it's pretty literal all, all things considered <laughs> yeah. um but i did i wasn't actually going to bring that up just to rag on moonfall i was going to mention that the other movie in the top five is scream five which uh i still haven't seen first point or scream scream as they're calling well it. I refuse to call it that. I refuse to call it that because there's a, there's already a movie called Scream. I saw it in 1996. Um, so Scream 5, which I still haven't seen as a first point. Second point, how fucking dare they? I've only just noticed this, but how fucking dare they make a movie that's the fifth Scream movie and not turn the E in the middle of Scream into a five? What are we doing? Like, it, 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 <laughs> it's a simple a simple thing to do. And the third, the third thing that I noticed when reading about these today... Is that the 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 pair of uh, filmmakers whose names have now escape me, but they're, they're sort of long term fans who have ban- managed to wrangle this new Scream movie. They mm. have dubbed it a requel, which I hate as a term. I hate Re- that so requel? much. A requel. So well, I they're guess redoing like, it. I think it's like half sequel, half reboot is the implication. Um, like but- like uh, Suicide Squad. Uh, I think no, I think so. mm, I guess that is a yeah because it kind of is. It's a there requel. Are some, there are some casts from the original ch- popping up in it. Yeah, I suppose that is a requel. Um, I mean, I would just call it a sequel though. To be, to be yeah, honest, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, it's just a sequel. It just like I mean, I think basically what a requel means in this context is mm-hmm. it's a sequel, but we couldn't think of anything better to do, so we just then the did original the stuff story. From the original story again. Like, is the Force Awakens Awakens yeah, a requel? I was <laughs> like, about to say that. Yeah, the Force Awakens. It's actually the requel trilogy. Yeah, yeah. They, they're just like, what? <laughs> what if Palpatine is here again? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I I saw that in Variety today, and I was very upset about it, and I was like. I'm a, a, a white man with a with a podcast, so I get to use this platform to complain about meaningless things like the term "requel." In, uh, <laughs> in that's in, that's in really movies. interesting. I I love that uh, the the requel. Um, I also love that Jackass Forever is in the uh, top five because oh, yeah. it's doing really I well. really it's only just come out in the UK like this weekend past, and I'm me and my father-in-law are p- planning to go see it together this Sunday so I really don't want it to leave the cinema yet so please b- be successful in the UK as well oh I think it will I, it's doing really well I, I and I, ja- I've always had a soft spot for Jackass I will definitely be going mm-hmm. to watch that uh, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it um, <laughs> and I, I would I think it's fair to say that the movie we're here to talk about today is about mm-hmm. as far away from a jackass movie as you could hope to get. I'm trying to think if there's anything tonal. I guess although like- it does, it does sound like hi, my name is Johnny Knoxville, and this is Tick Tick Boom. Like it does sound like something that he would do. Yeah, uh, that- <laughs> it, it, as a as a jackass stunt. <laughs> yeah, you just strap a bunch of explosives and flower packets to Wee Man and send him running through a a field like full of bulls or something like that. That sounds like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds like the kind it. of thing they would do. You've, you've nailed it. Yeah. yeah, perfect. I'll I'll have a check for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but yes, let's talk about um, Tick Tick Boom then because uh, mm-hmm. we'll talk about yeah. Jackass when, when that comes out. So I'm considering this. You know my stance on this. I know it's, it's overly prescriptive and arbitrary, but... This movie technically came out, I think it was the AF, AFI Film Festival in like November 2021. I'm calling this a 2022 release because it came out for normal people who don't get to go to film festivals in 2022. That's my stance. Did it though? I think it did. It came out on ne- in, on Netflix on November 19th, I thought. Oh, was it? Has it been on Netflix for that long? Maybe I'm just I, wrong then. I think it has. I think I honestly think it has. Oh, okay. I think it's just like it's obviously just popped up in your algorithm in the next in the last sort of month or so. Yeah, maybe maybe I'm or it's probably I, because I don't have an original bone in my body. It's more that the the film critics that I follow have started talking about this, so I was like, I should probably talk about this as well. Um, yeah, maybe maybe. Uh, okay, well, I mean, maybe I was just so caught up in my like anger at, at the them using the uh, the the film festival thing <laughs> that I didn't actually notice that it released on Netflix around about the same time. So. Fair enough. I hold my hands up. Um, <laughs> it is the directorial debut of one Lin Manuel Miranda, who, yeah. and we will yeah. talk about that in a bit more detail because um, I knew basically nothing about this movie going in, including mm-hmm. that. Um, and there's stuff to be said about that, I think. Um, and and the big news 
Anthea, I d- something I don't even think you'll know here. The big news here <laughs> is that this was written by Stephen Levinson, and it, you might remember that name. Do you know what else he wrote last year? Um, it was another musical. I'll give you that hint. Stephen Le- Levinson, another musical. No, he adapted I'm... another musical. I should say, like it wasn't his original music. Like, it, he, so he he adapted West Side Story. No, oh god, he fucking wishes he adapted West Side Story. Stephen Levinson wrote the movie adaptation oh. of, De- of Dear Evan Hansen in 2021. Oh, so god. talk about bookending your year with the highs and lows of musical theatre. God damn, <laughs> like this is. Uh, I mean, you know unbelievable that he managed to do that and this in the same year um well he didn't have much work to do on dear Evan hansen because it was basically the stage play you know that's true yeah maybe maybe he just kind of corrected some punctuation and, and stuck his name on it um so okay this is essentially the story of um the I, i'm gonna get a lot of the words in this wrong because i don't know that much about musical theater but like i guess the the show creator like Jonathan Larson is that the, the the title of someone who kind of like writes all the music and all the songs for a for a a, a, a Broadway um, musical? Okay, yeah, the creator of yeah, we could just say that yeah. I'd, yeah, there's there's probably a title. There's, for there's, it, there's but... book there's book writer for the for the writer of the actual book, but um, sometimes there's like someone who writes the book and someone who writes the music. Yeah, um, and he's definitely I, the composer of these things. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But so he, he um, it's essentially the story of Jonathan Larson attempting to manage his relationships as he searches for the crucial final song of his sci-fi musical, Superbia. Superbia? Superbia. <laughs> Su- Superbia, yeah. Yeah, which is... I, I, I'd never heard it. I, I'm not an expert on musical theatre, so the fact that I had never heard of Superbia when I started watching this movie is not mm-hmm. necessarily a sign that it was not popular. But I have heard of Rent, and I was like, I don't think this is the one that he got big with and i was kind of waiting uh, yeah to see. i part of me thought like i'd never heard of superbia either and part of me thought to myself um is this just something they've made up so that they don't have to license rent and mm. and like you know but by the end of the by the end obviously it's no no this is actually a real thing that he created uh i don't know whether it was ever actually put on um but yeah, apparently he created a sci-fi yeah. futuristic thing well, where he kind of predicted like how much control. It's I suppose he took massive influence from 1984. Let's be honest. Yeah, but I mean the idea of like people's lives being dominated by you know their the, their screens and the relationships they form through those screens. I mean it's pretty mm-hmm. it's pretty prescient to be honest. Um, yeah. I had that exact same question at the end of this. So I I mean. I don't think it's a spoiler because they say it in literally like the first five minutes of the movie. Uh, Jonathan Larson, and in fact, I've already said it in this episode. So spoilers, Jonathan Larson died when he was 35. Uh, mm-hmm. the, I think the day before Rent was due to debut on Broadway. So re- really tragic. That's um, just a spoiler for life though. That, that 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 fact doesn't really play into the movie until like the, basically in the credits, like saying, where are they now? You know? I, I don't know if I... No, if you knew if you knew if you knew that fact before you watched it, it would obviously make a lot of difference for you. But I mean, it's not a spoiler for the plot of the movie. No, it's it's not a spoiler for that. But I think it impacts the tone that I received the movie in because when you know yeah. that he is going to die quite young, presumably, because you mm-hmm. you kind of you know what time what like what kind of era the movie is set in. Like it sort of opens in the the nineties, and you know mm-hmm. that Rent kind of got big in the mid nineties, and he was dead by that point. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, this is going to be this is this is going to end quite tragically for this person. I think it sort of sets the stage quite well for what it does with his character especially um, considering the uh the relationships that he has with certain characters yeah. and the idea of mortality is very much there you know yeah definitely um so okay a little bit of of uh, of, of homework or not homework like uh, 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 setting out how much we actually know about this before we go in then did, mm-hmm. you're you're much better at musical theater than i am did you did you know anything about jonathan larson before you went into this uh no in fact when i first heard about this film being made i i didn't realize it was the guy who made rent i thought it was the guy who did like uh a lot of the disney renaissance musicals uh because he also died um oh, okay but uh but so i honestly didn't know anything i didn't even rent i've seen rent like one time uh yeah. you know so nope nope not, not okay. much at all no so i mean i'm aware of rent i've never seen any version of it um so I'll, I'll be completely honest because i i think it's important to be honest about your biases when you come mm-hmm. into a movie 
I was coming into this with a pretty strong skepticism of Lin-Manuel Miranda as a director um, because I, I, I'm pretty hot and cold on Lin-Manuel Miranda as a creator in general um, and I didn't know what which, which really was. really irks me but we'll get we'll, we'll past it. <laughs> well okay let's so let's let's talk about him let's get down to business when it comes to mm. Lin-Manuel Miranda so first things first I guess with this mm. is that he's directing someone else's music which is a really interesting place for him to start as a director I think uh, as, a, as a as a musician um, and, and a clearly an aspiring director um, yeah. how, how did you feel he got on with that? Yeah so that was actually something that I mentioned to you I think before you even saw the film the style of the movie is not what I was expecting based on his directorial debut he mm. used <clears throat> quite a lot of varied presentation styles yes um so i i and and like obviously he was based on the tick tick boom where jonathan larson's sitting at the piano talking to the camera so you've got this narration happening you've got yeah. this sort of fourth wall breaking aspect you've got uh lots of like sort of almost found footage you know, uh, like the VHS stuff, VHS basically. cutaways. Yeah, you've also got whenever he makes notes in his in his uh, journal or his notes in his little notebook, it coming up and being written on the screen behind him, which I thought mm. was really classy, and I like that. So I I think I was actually now in terms of the actual direction of the actors. Again, apparently uh, uh, Andrew Garfield had never sung before he did this movie. So oh, that's outrageous. He, if that's he true. he learnt to sing for this movie. In fact, I actually read that there was a really interesting thing. Then Manuel Miranda wanted Andrew Garfield for it because he just thought, you know, his his acting style and like the the look of him and all, he would be great for the for the role. Um, so he asked. They apparently they have a, like a friend in common who's a masseuse, and I know don't get into it. But he basically <laughs> uh, he 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 basically he basically asked. We've all got uh, like that. Yeah, he he basically asked the masseuse, um, you know, can Andrew sing? And the masseuse goes... I'll make, I'll I mean, make him sing. Yeah, 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 yeah. The masseuse actually said he's got a voice of an angel. And this is... The story goes, right, that once Manuel Miranda left, the masseuse rang up Andrew Guffer and said, can, can you sing? You know, basically, <laughs> he, he, can thank, he can thank the masseuse. But he, he went through like a whole year of training to sing for this. And that's what I think, like... See, especially in the in the song uh, Bohem, like the life Bohemia or whatever, yeah. bo 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 So you understand, like you know, this is the life for ho bo um. You understand yeah, that yeah, joke I now. get that but, now. I finally understand that joke. Yeah, yeah, but so especially in the, in that scene, like which is really stripped back, a cappellary, you know, musical moment. Mm. Andrew Garfield comes across so natural in that, and I yeah, you, you have to put that down in a way to Lin Manuel Miranda's direction. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think I, it's 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 always difficult to uh, when it comes to like an actor's performance to pick out how much of it is director and how much of it is actor but i think one thing that you can always be certain of is that a bad director can make a very good actor look mm -hmm. bad if they if they direct them poorly and mm -hmm. that certainly isn't the case in this so at the very least lin manuel miranda knew enough about working with actors which i mean obviously mm -hmm. he would because he's been on broadway for god knows how many years at this point he's been surrounded by actors the whole time also also he being in in musicals that he is the creator of and therefore the de facto sort of leader of them as yeah, well you exactly. know yeah so i mean he he's he's occupied a very a very important sort of prominent position as this kind of creative director of things that he's made um but i mean i think that at the very least is evidence that he knows how like how to allow good actors to come across as good actors which yeah. i think we'll, we'll we'll talk about andrew garfield specifically um in a moment because i think he definitely deserves uh singling out for praise with with uh, his performance in this um mm -hmm. but one thing i wanted to go back to very briefly is that um something else you mentioned which is that this he makes some pretty bold choices like visually yeah. and stylistically so you've already mentioned like you know the the words coming out um of when he writes it down in the notebook i i really liked the kind of vhs framing device i yeah, almost yeah. Wi I, I don't know if I'm, I'm, i'll go back and forth in it i kind of wish all of the tick tick boom stuff where he's performing that's kind was of like in that a, yeah. a framing device yeah i understand why it's not because some of the best songs in the whole movie are in that and if he did it all yeah. through that vhs um a lens it might get a little bit tiring um but I, I thought it was great it was really stylish i thought some of the choices that you could kind of see the artifice of them like they were a little bit clunky the, the one where he was swimming 
and mm-hmm. the uh, and he has like this revelation about a song he's going to write, and then it cuts mm-hmm. to a bird's eye view of the pool, and it turns into like a musical stave. I was mm-hmm. a bit like, okay, that's I, I I respect the fact you've done that, but I I think that's a little bit over the top. But still, <laughs> the fact he did it. I think is credit to him for having the the creative vision to do something like that that he doesn't need to do. Um, I, I think it was yeah. impressive. Uh, I, yeah, I like when um, he's, like you know uh, he didn't direct it, but in the Heights as well. Whenever they sort of had like the CG elements coming out, like where they were drawing with their finger and it was like fireworksy kind of thing. Yeah, I like <clears throat> when musicals just lean into the fact that they're musicals and they have some sort of things that aren't really realistic yeah, and they absolutely. have a bit sort of sort of fantasy to them. So I, I thought he did a really good job. Um I, I I'm gonna be honest with you, like the Lin Manuel Miranda is in the moment in his career where he's done now four or five things in the public eye. He's done in the Heights, he's done Hamilton, he's done uh Moana, he's done Encanto, he did he's done Tick Tick Boom now, he's um he's been in Mary Poppins, he's been in yeah. um What's that other one uh, that I've that I've watched? Uh, His Dark Materials. Okay. So yep. he's at the point, and he's also done uh, one on uh, also a musical, which I haven't actually seen, which apparently isn't that good. Uh, is a Netflix musical about um, Cuba. But anyway, he's at the point now where he's done enough stuff that the moment of Lin Manuel Miranda is coming to an end uh, in terms of like the moment of his like breakout five years in the industry. Yeah, and we're <clears throat> going to start seeing. You know, hipsters like Conrad and like. Uh, <laughs> I would like to point out, I disliked yeah. Lin Manuel Miranda before it was cool to do so. Like, well, you, have, you haven't seen Hamilton yet, so you know. No, we'll, that is true. We'll, we'll take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, you will watch Hamilton. I'm, I'm forbidding you to watch it without me because I am going to force you to like that. Yeah, but, I've, I've, I almost I, I thought about it the other day, and then I was like, no, I can't do that to Anthony. I need to. Oh, I really need want, to watch you know, it together. We've we've been planning this for, 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 since before we lived in the same country, but. Um, but basically, like we're at a point now in his career where I, you know, th- there's going to be a fork. There's going to be people who loved his original stuff, but now it's sort of just too samey for them, yeah. or or like they just don't like the direction he went in, or whatever. And there's going to be the people who stick with him and are, are the diehard fan. It's just, it's just, an, it's just the fact of fact, fact of nature. Like you are never going to keep a hundred percent of the audience happy. And if, and and I'm at the point now where I'm 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 uncomfortable. Because I'm starting to hear the voices, uh, you know, the the hipster voices. I call them hipsters because I'm because I'm because I'm I'm against them. So I call them hipsters because I'm you know I'm yeah. very pompous. You have to but, you have to <laughs> you have to de- undermine them at every possibility. Yeah, I'm trying to undermine them. But so I'm on. I'm definitely still on the Lin Manuel Miranda track. Uh, mm. Now maybe one day I'll sort of shift a little bit off and come more into the neutral zone. Um, I, I don't think the man can do no wrong, but in terms of his actual musical uh, stuff that he's putting out, negating the Netflix one I haven't seen, which is apparently bad. Um, I, 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 I'm still on the, I'm still on the, I'm still on the train. I'm still yeah. on the bloody train. You know. I mean, I, I, I would say after this, I've got like one foot on the train and I'm kind of hanging out the side a little bit. Like I'm thinking about yeah. jumping back on the platform, <laughs> but I've not done it yet. Um, <laughs> like I, I, I think it's. I don't know what it says about me or or my relationship with Lin Manuel Miranda that like the stuff I like best of his is the stuff where he's barely in it. Um, like I really like Moana and I I really liked this and I really appreciated that he shows up for a thirty second cutaway and then and then is never in it again because I don't think he's much of an actor. Um, I I personally think I, I agree with you and I said and I've said this before that I think that I can understand why he did it like you know he's he's in demand and he's he, you know he wants to be an actor as well I get it but I but I do kind of think that there's a potential of spreading himself too thin and yeah. I also think that the type of like he he's, he's not the type of guy who can play every role and no. therefore he will come across as a bit of spit samey you know what I mean yeah. and I think that he may be at I like that he's sort of stepping a little bit back and not being in every single thing. So, if, as you mentioned, like literally ten seconds of this, two seconds of this, you know. Yeah. Um. It's so I like that he's making those decisions because I think that he was he was the main star on Broadway in in the Heights. He was the main star on Broadway in Hamilton, and I think that it's at the point now where he needs to manage how much people are seeing him yes. because he it's too many irons in the fire, and he also isn't the isn't the actor that can completely change who he is for a role you know yeah and and i do, i do think there's a there's a big difference between being a stage actor and being a movie actor as well not to say one is mm-hmm. better or worse than the other but 
when you're in musical theater your performance needs to be big it needs mm-hmm. to you know reach the people in the back there's not very much subtlety required for it or it doesn't really allow for very much subtlety and i i think i, I i've not seen him in, in, on the stage so but I, i've heard loads of people say he's really good so i assume he's really good at that but then when the camera's right up in his face it's kind of like mm-hmm. oh you you kind of a a bit of a a bit of a nothing here um but i mean i with that said mm. you know his music definitely although it's not his music in this but like his music in yeah. other films um like really appealed to me and his direction in this um i thought was 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 really really good for, well for, that's for the thing as well music. conrad is i forget people view him as an actor like when yeah, i when i, I talk so. about miranda i'm literally talking about the music that he's written like I'm, I'm 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 talking about his musicals that he has made he, he's written and his yeah. and his songs i the fact that he's an actor it's like the member of the rolling stones who showed up in pirates of the caribbean you know i'm not going to hold that against their music <laughs> you should you hold know? it against keith richards he shouldn't have done yeah that. yeah keith richards yeah <laughs> like so like lin manuel miranda appearing in his dark materials is kind of like keith richards appearing in okay. pirates of the caribbean to me it's like no he's 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 a he's a he's a musical writer yeah. who just happens to be doing other stuff the, f- the other stuff he's doing doesn't change my opinion of his yeah. musical writing that, you know? that that is a fair point i suppose uh, like mm-hmm. i think it, it's it's uh yeah I've, I've just seen more of him as an actor than i have of him as a as a um a songwriter although i mean i made a fool out of myself the other week because i didn't realize that he wrote the music to moana so what do i know um but i will say just to finish it sorry there's on. one key point here <clears throat> because it's something that i missed out on because i don't know anything about jonathan larson before this film but I did watch an interview with the cast and Lin Manuel. Jesus Christ, Miranda, Lin, Big Lin, Lin, Big Linny, Linny. So Linny, right? Um, I don't know. My, my 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 mouth is doing something weird there. Um, so anyway, uh, I watched an interview with him and the cast, and there was a moment where a lot of the cast became very tearful because they were saying that they this film meant so much to them because they were working with with Lin mm. and that they their generation of like musical stars and like them the, the group of friends and all sort of thing they they view lynn as like their jonathan larson yeah I and see that's that. yeah that's yeah and that was a real touching moment and i thought to myself i was like yeah that's why like you know he's the, he's the musical writer he's not like the he's not the his dark materials guy he's like the musical writer and i have respect for him for that and like i just thought like you know that was a really nice touching moment you know? yeah yeah I, I think that's um that's yeah that's interesting and i can definitely see that and i think that that will let us segue quite nicely into mm-hmm. talking a bit in a bit more detail about andrew garfield we can talk about the rest of the cast here as well yeah, yeah, yeah. um but i wanted to single out garfield because I, I, it was a really great performance from him i thought like he's yeah, yeah. he's he's like magnetic in this uh there's a there's a kind of lightness to him a slight kind of campness but but nothing like it doesn't seem like he's playing it for laughs he just he he seems like someone who you know was very much in that kind of musical theater scene in the in the uh in the late 80s and early 90s in new york um and he absolutely nails the character and i and i think that the thing i really wanted uh, to uh talk about with as regards to mm-hmm. him and the reason why i thought it's important tonally for them to establish the sort of tragedy of his death early on is that his character could easily come across as a bit of a dick in this because he sort it like sort of his whole thing is neglecting the people around him to make his musical um and if you don't play that right and you don't get the tone right it could mm-hmm. come across as a bit like well this guy is a twat i don't want him to succeed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like because you know he's awful to his girlfriend he's awful to his friends you know one of his friends um or, or two of his friends in fact uh, end up uh, hiv positive in this and he's kind yeah. of like doesn't have enough time to go and uh to see them and make sure they're okay because he's writing his musical but garfield's performance is so so on the money mm-hmm that it never i never felt myself kind of uh, moving away from from supporting him as the protagonist i feel the same way i did feel a little empathy for his girlfriend definitely yeah, but yeah but but i could see like i could i could see the the, the the type of character he was and like the stresses he was under like you have to remember as well like this they didn't like I know, like he, he seems like he's a little bit of an egomaniac in a way, but but then it was but at the same time I genuinely do believe that he cared about his friends as well. Yeah, it's yeah. just that he was caught up in his dreams and caught up in 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 what he was doing. And I think and I think actually it's interesting because if you look if you just think about the, the cold hard facts of what was happening, 
Um, you know, he did. He, he was a dick to a number of people, but yeah, I think you have to give a lot of credit to Andrew Garfield. You're right because, uh, yeah, I I was with him, and you know, what are we? We're, we're in a bloody Andrew Garfield renaissance here. Like, what's going I, on? I was thinking that as well. You know, there's been some great Garfield performances. He sort of reminded people. It's like we've gone back to 2007 or whenever the Social Network came out. Like, yeah. like that year when everyone was like, "This Andrew Garfield guy is pretty good." Um, and I can't believe you know talk, talking about what you've revealed like 10 minutes ago with him not really singing before this mm -hmm. like singing is great uh the physical performance is yep. great and mm -hmm. that that life bohemian to oh, yeah. to have that to have the confidence to sing what is literally an acapella song apart from people kind of clapping to to give the song mm -hmm. rhythm um to have the confidence to carry that yourself as as someone yeah. who by all accounts wasn't a very good singer before they started practicing yeah. for it that's amazing amazing to do it and uh, and i thought you did a really good job of it yeah, and that that scene in particular, I really I love that atmosphere in that scene and the performance and the direction. That scene was perfect for me, and I, and I and I felt like I felt in that that I really now it was never said in the dialogue, but just from that film that that scene. Sorry, I assume that that life Bohemia is like I, I got the impression from his performance that ev like every time they have a big party like this, he'll like he'll sing this song, and yeah. the verses were always different. You know what I mean? Um, about what he's singing about and like they were all into it they all loved it and they, this is the, you know this is the guy who's the life and soul of the party the yeah. fact that he had no money but he was still buying a load of drink for his friends to have fun you know i i yeah he came come across very endearing um yeah absolutely. and i i think he must have got the bug in terms of singing because i've seen a trailer for a new film coming out in the uk called the eyes of tammy Faye, uh okay. with him and jessica chastain about um about a televangelist and i think in the trailer i've seen it he's singing in that so he okay. he must have he must have caught the bug he must well, have caught the bug. yeah look look look, uh, look for andrew garfield on a broadway stage near you uh yeah. sometime soon um yeah i mean it, like yeah he, he's fantastic i think like the comparison in my, that, that my that my head went to when i was watching this was with like miles teller in whiplash which is obviously tonally a very mm. different movie but that that's like a musician who basically just tells everyone including his family to like fuck themselves i'm going to focus on on being uh, the best musician i can and kind yeah. of compromises a lot of his humanity in doing so um and i think part of the fact he comes across as a dick in that is because it's miles teller who is very easy to hate but um andrew garfield does such a wonderful perform such a wonderful performance in this and uh, yeah it's well worth seeing just for that um and talking about the music mm -hmm. as we all know if you're going to write a musical you need to open it with a toe tapper. That's just the way that musicals work. Like you, you're not opening it with some, you know, deep cut from the middle of your album that's like really slow and and somber. And this this musical has got quite a few very good songs in it. Mm -hmm. I didn't love all of them, but that opener of uh, Thirty Ninety is such a great song. It was I, I it was yeah, yeah. A, a proper earworm that song. It was in my head, still in my head now, to be honest. But uh, yeah, it was definitely properly in my head for a couple of days after this. It actually reminded me quite a lot of uh, Bo Burnham. Th you know, I'm turning thirty. Yeah, um, I had a bit of that. Like that's so I, I can't, yeah. maybe it's because I'm in my thirties. I was like, this is resonating with me in a way yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. I'm not that happy about. I think uh, as well, it's interesting that Bo Burnham was 30 in 2020. So exactly 30 years after uh, Jonathan Larson's 30 at 3090. Yeah. That that makes me think that Bo Burnham was in some way uh, inspired by that song. But um, <laughs> I choose I, to I believe do... that's the case. I've got no evidence to support it, but, <laughs> but whatever. Well, you know, Bo Burnham's a, a musical like liking guy. But but I'll, but I'll say as well is that apparently Lin-Manuel Miranda went into the the deep troves of uh, Jonathan Larson's uh, collection and like, you know, his, uh, his, his music to ensure that there was the, uh, the, the right amount of music in this, which, which was his, so mm. that he got credited with the score. Um, so it, this is credited as his, as his score. So that all the songs, I think there was no songs written for this that, you know, that weren't his, but some mm. of the songs weren't in the original Tick Tick Boom, uh, and oh, okay. and they, and they were they were sort of found within his collections and stuff in well, order to put them in. So I'm assuming that "Come to Your Senses" song that his his uh, ex girlfriend by the end of this and um, mm, and maybe. the uh, the the female vocalist for for his his um, his uh, musical perform as a duet I, that was from. It was, in the narrative of this it's from superbia so i assume that's what that comes from but that's a, that, a yeah. wonderful piece of music as well like a lovely a lovely kind of moving ballad um at the end of the mm -hmm. at the end of the second act that i that i really really enjoyed 
Yeah, it was good to see Vanessa Hudgens back as well doing that. Um, oh, I didn't realise it was her. My partner leaned over to me and was like, do you know who that is? And then told me it was Vanessa Hudgens. I couldn't believe it. She's breaking great. free, finally. She's great breaking to see free. <laughs> yeah, great to see her back. <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, no, no, Get her good. and Zac Efron yeah. in a musical together again. Get the band back together, guys. Come on. Zac Efron. Yeah. You know, Zac Efron, uh, apparently, he can't sing, right? And uh, he can't sing like, really well. And... In the first high school musical, he isn't singing. It's it's. Uh, he, I think he did like one note in the actual yeah. song <laughs> to to try and blend it in. But uh, in the, he like well, insisted. He, it up while he, yeah, yeah, while yeah, yeah, yeah. That's. I think that's what they have to do. So literally in uh, in the, the second and third high school musicals, um, his agent and him insisted that he sing. So mm-hmm. they had to literally uh, re like you know change the key of songs in oh, order boy. to have him be able to sing them. That's out there. I mean that that. That's a lot of work to go through just to get Zac Efron <laughs> in your musical. But, I mean, you know, the proof's in the pudding. People like those movies a lot. Um, and we're still talking about Zac Efron and Vanessa, Vanessa Hudgens 20 years after... Well, it was not 20 years. When was the last high school musical? Like, 2006? Something I don't know, like actually. That. That's a, when was the first one? Yeah, it must be near 20 years now. I feel like I feel like they were they were they came out quite quickly. There was only three, right? And I feel like they were between, like, 2004 and 2008, is my yeah, guess. Yeah, well- Two years in two years' time, that'll be twenty, won't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, there are thereabouts. Everything feels like twenty years when you. High School Musical three came out in two thousand eight. Oh. Uh, yeah, so High School Musical one came out in two thousand six. Actually, so they, they, geez, they came Bloody out pretty hell, quickly, like, didn't they? Absolutely fire. That's like Peter Jackson making Lord of the Rings, just like boom, 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 three. Years, <laughs> yeah. Get them all out. Yeah. Geez. Okay. Fair well, enough. I right, didn't do that. Okay. Um. Yeah. I mean. That I think Vanessa Hudgens, she didn't really have much of a character in this, but obviously she's a good singer and she did a great job with her music, uh, musical yeah. parts. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about here, because it was actually the only bit of the movie that like really made me come close to tearing up. Um, mm-hmm. And it's it's kind of dumb. It, in fact, it's very dumb. But like Bradley Whitford plays Stephen Sondheim in this, who is essentially, he's essentially like this kind of, indication that Larson is doing good narratively mm-hmm. is so he turns up to be like you're all right kid and then and then disappear um mm-hmm. th- and he's he's sort of a the deus ex musicianer in this like he just he well, he, well he did he did have a relationship with Jonathan uh, no, Larson yeah, in, yeah. in this way obviously I, I don't think he ever said exactly what was said in the movie like that well so okay this is the interesting thing about this so i um, i think i know a, what you're saying so there's a moment towards the end of this film, like Stephen, mm-hmm. Hux, uh, like Bradley Whitford has been Stephen Sondheim for the entire movie. He's turned up a couple mm-hmm. of times and said, "You're doing good," and then you know disappeared. <laughs> and there's yeah, a yeah. moment towards the end of the film where Sondheim leaves a voicemail for uh, Jonathan Larson, and mm-hmm. apparently in the musical that this is based on, uh, Stephen Sondheim actually did do this. So there's a moment where he listens to a voicemail message or an answer phone message, I guess it would have been at the time. And Stephen Sondheim recorded something for the show to be played. And I have heard citation needed for this because, um, well, I know, I know part of this is definitely true, but citation needed for this first bit because I've heard it through reputable sources, but I can't actually find a source for this for myself. Um, apparently Stephen Sondheim heard Whitford's take of it for the movie and mm-hmm. phoned Miranda with some suggestions saying basically I don't think I would have said that here's what I would actually say and, yeah. and Lin-Manuel Miranda was like well fuck that I'm just going to use the recording that you've left on my on my voicemail um, for the actual lines in this movie so we yeah, you're to... almost you're you're almost there. It's it's crazy to be honest with you, but but I think it's I think it actually he did like because Bradley Whitford was it was it, it was he was caught up uh, and and he couldn't come and record it. That's oh, okay. again. I think that's but still but still it's basically the same thing, you know. Yeah. And it's it's crazy that it's I I didn't notice the difference in voice. Oh, uh, like, as as I, that was like a, to be honest, I was quite proud of myself because as soon as I heard the voicemail, I was like, that's fucking Stephen Sondheim talking on the on the uh, on the answer oh, phone at the end of this movie. Oh, that's good. And obviously, like Stephen Sondheim died in November last year. Um, yeah. And it made it made me tear up a little bit because I was like, "Fuck, that's Stephen Sondheim." So this must have been like he must have recorded this. Uh, I mean, it, they could have recorded it in 2019 or something, whenever they were yeah. filming this. But the the proximity to his death, I was like, "Ah, oh, shit, that's Stephen Sondheim." It was a very very touching moment to you know get get the uh, you know the voice of, um, of of you know an entire generation of musical theatre. It's very it does feel. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that you mentioned before about uh, actors of Lin Manuel Miranda's generation being like, "Oh, we see you as our Jonathan Larson," because yeah. in this movie, I think I don't think necessarily explicitly, but you kind of have Stephen Sondheim, 
to Jonathan Larson to Lin Manuel Miranda, and that, I'm probably oversimplifying that as someone yeah, who yeah, yeah. isn't in the world of musical theatre and doesn't know that much about it, but it felt profound in a way that that was very touching. Yeah. I thought. Yeah, no, I, no, I agree. I felt the same way, and I I thought it was interesting as well because obviously, obviously, Jonathan Larson had a. This was based on his musical that he wrote as mm. like it's interesting that he wrote this as sort of a backlash to not getting Superbia written. Yeah. Um, but but at the same time, you know, he had he had obviously, and then he passed away as well, which adds intrigue to it, and like that's why they, this 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 movie was made. It, it must be interesting for Sondheim to st- have still been alive when this movie was being made of like a young musical composer that he mentored. Mm-hmm. Um, and then died and then another 25 30 years later after that there's a film being made about that guy's life yeah and, and it's just, it's really interesting to me because like i don't know about sondheim's personal life i don't know if they'll, they'll ever be if there's anything noteworthy within his personal life that would lead to a movie being made about him oh but there, I, there must be surely <laughs> like yeah, there he must, made some yeah. good musicals yeah, no, I know, but there's, is there the drama within his own life oh, to actually yeah. make I mean, a film could, out of it? it you know? It could be a bit of a um, like a, I don't know, a, like one of those typical musical biopics, just like this guy is great and he wrote loads of good songs. Let's enjoy him together, <laughs> which is what yeah, yeah, musical yeah, yeah. biopics tend to be. Exactly. So, I, you know, it's it's interesting to me, like that that just that, that that yeah that that dynamic there of like mm. him watching one of the people he mentored who died along. You know, it was really interesting. And you yeah, know, no, absolutely. He gave us Sweeney Todd, so you know you got to love the man. He did, yeah, and uh, um, and West Side Story, which is yeah. uh, which is pretty damn good as far as, if you're going to write a musical, West Side Story is not a bad one to have written the music for. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, okay, right, ratings. I'm I'm, ju- I'm going to be proactive and say let's do it. Let's go into ratings. Unless there's anything yep. else you wanted to talk about first. No, no, I think I've got. I've okay. laid this all out now, quite I well. I will then. remind you, Stephen Levinson wrote this, who is the guy who wrote Dear Evan Hansen. So just bear that in <sighs> mind when you're rating this movie, because we may need to dock it points pure, purely by association to that man. Yeah, <laughs> and the actor for Dear Evan Hansen has been nominated for a Razzie. Uh, oh, has he? Lovely. That's of course good he stuff. has. Um, Get Ben okay. Platt ben, out of ben movies. Platt, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine if Ben Platt had played Jonathan Larson in this movie. Actually, having said he that, been, he, he probably would have been actually. all right. He probably would have been all right yeah. because he'd been playing his age as opposed yeah. to <laughs> uh, as opposed to a seventy-five year old playing a ten-year-old or whatever. Yeah, he, he wouldn't have had to have an inch of makeup on his face to make himself look thirteen. Like, um, God, what, just, what would you give this? Yeah. Uh, what would you give Tick Tick Boom as a rating? Um. I'm gonna go four star. I'm gonna be conservative with it. Um, I really enjoyed this film though, and I, I. But I think that, you know, when I look back on films that I've watched in the last year, it's not my favorite movie that I've seen in the last year. But definitely, I think it's something that I will return to. So I think four stars is a strong score, um, and it's not worthy of the five for me. Yeah, no, I think I agree. I, I really enjoyed this. I was really surprised by it. I, I, mm-hmm. I thought I like music musicals, but I, I was kind of a little bit skeptical about this one going in. But I have mm-hmm. no reservations in saying this is really good fun four star movie definitely check it out if you are yep. even remotely interested in musicals or musical theatre um, mm-hmm. cool okay and that's going to lead us to answering one very simple question as we always do and that is Anthony what's your favourite movie this week uh, I'm going to do it again I'm going to say tick tick boom I've done oh. about only three times three or four times the whole of this mu- of this movie podcast but I'm going to go with the film we watched yeah no I'm, I'm actually going to do the same thing I, I will full disclosure I wrote down The Greatest Showman as a joke because I thought we might arrive at Zac Efron via an oh, yeah. <laughs> through this um, but I'm not going to make that joke I'm simply going to acknowledge that I could have um, and I'm going <laughs> to and I'm going to say tick tick boom for me as well it's a good one um, and yep. that's going to do it for us here on the best movie podcast ever i don't know why i'm talking in a slightly slower <laughs> in a cadence. robot voice <laughs> yeah beep burp i'm in super um, yeah we, was, we didn't pa- we're supposed to power you down after the podcast conrad <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes no like uh, that's uh, i mean i'm not gonna make any jokes about that that's that's just how we live our lives to be honest i'm, I'm <laughs> turned off and put in a cupboard until next week <laughs> thank you to nancy wyatt and jared iscariot for the use of our theme song which wasn't in superbia but is superb uh, you can find links to their stuff down <laughs> in the- how does he think of this stuff i'm on fire um 
<laughs> you find, I, I, I can make jokes off the cuff, but I can't remember simple lines that I say every week. <laughs> Links to their stuff down in the description below. Check them out. Um, and thank you to you for listening. Uh, please consider subscribing if you haven't already. We are The Culture Cave on YouTube, and we're the best movie podcast ever on podcasting apps. Get involved in the comments. Let us know what you thought of Tick, Tick, Boom, or whatever you've been watching this week. Give the show a like. It really does help. And we will see you same time, same place, next week. And cut. Cut.